While watching Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I was struck by this scene, the roadside picnic waiting for the spacemen to reappear. Are you seeing what I see? These aren't just people looking to commune with aliens. They're looky-loos, interlopers, yokels, vulgarians. Roy and Jillian are in the midst of one of the biggest moments of their lives, and they're surrounded by country folk with no connection to the luminous light. Steven Spielberg is showing us something specific here, something you won't find in his work after, say, 1982. A judgment of the common man. A what? Now we're used to these figures from Steven Spielberg. Staunch, dowdy characters full of resolve and morals, embodiments of dignity. But the young Spielberg, in the first stage of his career from 71 to 82, was a little more freewheeling with his portrayal of people, and often cast a suspicious eye on the common man. Here are some examples. In Spielberg's first movie, Duel, Dennis Weaver is chased by a demented truck across the Cali Desert. Now there are several common men in the mix, from the goober running the gas pump to the portly lady doing laundry, Ending up with a crowd of roughnecks. Those faces, creased, lantern jaw, drunk, unimpressed. Spielberg wants to keep us guessing as to which one is the malevolent truck driver, but goddamn if this isn't a wall of surliness designed to make Weaver look milk toast. Also, Duel features the first example of a young Spielberg trope a crowd of wicked children. The Sugarland Express follows outlaws Goldie Hawn and William Atherton as they blunder their way from San Antonio to Houston to get their baby back from protective services. There's a bit of a Bonnie and Clyde thing going on here where they accrue a level of fame. But watch as the criminals drive through a parade in their honor, feted like folk heroes by an adoring small Texas town. This is a fame-seeking horde trying to touch something great, losing all individual sense. Look at the rapturous bliss. These people look like they just saw Mary at Lourdes. They even give Goldie Hawn a fucking pig. But it's the summertime throngs of Jaws I love the most. Not just because this might be one of the best films ever made, but because the movie stakes are so obviously high. Mayor Vaughn is practically begging people to fling themselves into the serrated maw of doom. Please, get it, Jordan. Chief Brody has to fight against bureaucratic ineptitude along with the Carcharodon. Those bathers, though. The jiggly, old, pale bodies occluding the beaches are dull and loathsome distractions to Brody. Some bad hat, Harry. In addition to being thick-headed ignoramuses about the danger they're in. Now look again at the rubes from Close Encounters. They're the perfect object of derision. This isn't a picnic. This is the next step in human history. They disgust me. And I think I detect disgust from the young Spielberg. Why even my dog has a gas mask? Also, wicked children alert. With the lack of a true villain in this movie, I nominate that boy in the crib. And you also promised Goofy Golf. Which leads me to Poltergeist. And no, I'm not saying that Toby Hooper didn't direct it, just that it was heavily steered by producer-writer Spielberg. The Freeling family phased down a ghost from their TV set. But you know what's really scary? James Caron. The character actor's had a long career of fighting the dead, but he's never played a bigger villain than Louis Teague, a man who stands head-to-head -head with Larry Vaughn for most threatening, corrupt, middle-aged doofus in a suit. Speaking of doofuses, Poltergeist is some of the most riceable common men in the arsenal. Dickhole TV buddy Dan Blocker riding a kid's BMX bike carrying a case of beer, getting wiped out by wicked children! Of course, there's Ben Tuttle, the Freeling's neighbor, belligerently flipping the channel from football to Mr. Rogers. But that's nothing compared to watching Tuttle freeze up at the end. Ben helps her out of the corpse pool, but he and the wife bug out when Diane tries to get them to help save her children. The ultimate example of neighborly indifference since Kitty Genovese. All my films come from the part of myself that I really can't articulate. I certainly have intuitive facilities, but I don't really analyze those. Or I don't really question them. It's like looking a gift horse in the mouth. Now here's my theory. Spielberg was a product of the post-war American baby boom. His intellectual gifts were evident from a young age, setting the stage for a successful start to his career in the late 1960s. I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a little benign judgment on his part. Looking down at the common clay, he might have considered himself better than. Most of us who moved away from the suburbs to the cities are guilty of it. But have you noticed that a lot of these people look like they just stepped out of a Grant Wood painting? For a country racked with upheaval just a few years before, there's no hint of the 60s in any of these wasps. No one smoked pot, no one burned a bra, no one dropped out. They're the same shovel-faced, mid-century stiffs, untouched by modernity. They might be the easiest straw men Spielberg could conjure, gently standing in for the indifferent or ignorant forces of reality.
finest in men's neckwear since 1982.